Hey, this is JR, aka The Tourist. Welcome to Central Java. In this video, I stop in the third world city of Bandung, climb some steps and learn some helpful Indonesian phrases, and eat some tiny fried crabs in the city of Yogyakarta. Join me as I leave Jakarta and see what awaits me in Central Java. I started my journey in central Jakarta, departing from the Gambir station and heading to Bandung, the first stop on my central Java jaunt. Indonesians have a lot of pride around their trains. Indonesian Railways is currently rolling out a series of new high-speed rail lines. In fact, a new train to Bandung has recently begun operation, making the trip in under an hour. But I took the regular train, which takes about three and a half hours. As the train left the station, heading south and east out of Jakarta, I saw the buildings get smaller and fewer and far between, and then I saw the Javanese countryside up close for the first time. It did not disappoint. We get to experience few really transformative experiences in day-to-day -day life. It isn't that they're not there, they're all around. But in day-to-day -day life, we tend to overlook them. But travel tends to change that. At least once we're done worrying about whether we've got our passport or if we're gonna make it to the gate on time. The sun appearing over the horizon as your plane ascends above the clouds. A series of foamy white waves lapping at the shores of an immaculate stretch of beach or the vista of a choked and crowded city giving way to the serene Southeast Asian countryside. These moments are not transformative in the personal sense. They're not about me. Maybe that's why I cherish them so. I arrived Bandung in the evening. I stayed at the Hotel Savoy Holland, the official hotel of the Asia-Africa Conference, the event that brought me to Bandung. No, I'm not attending, I'd be a little late for that. The following morning I awoke with the city and headed just up the block to the Merdeka building. It was here, in April 1955, that Indonesia's first president, Sukarno, hosted the Bandung Conference, or the Asian Africa Conference. Prior to its independence in 1947, Indonesia was a Dutch colony, one of many European colonies in Asia and Africa. Following World War II, the rhetoric of freedom and democracy used to combat the Axis powers fueled a wave of rapid decolonialization. Though these new nations were technically independent, they still had to contend with the Cold War and the new antagonism between the first world of liberal democratic capitalist nations and the second world of new socialist nations. The Bandung Conference was part of an effort by these new nations to forge a set of principles for self-determination. The term third world has become synonymous with the least developed countries, with a certain kind of hopelessness. But the term was founded in hope hoped that the newly independent nations of Asia and Africa could chart their own course. These ideals and principles were high-minded ones, and like the modernist architecture of Bandung, something from another age. There's a lot more to see and explore in this area of Java. Bandung is well known for the nature of the surrounding area. For me, this was but a brief stop on my journey east. My train to the next stop departed in the evening, leaving me with just enough time to check out Braga Street. Braga Street really comes alive at night, but if you're here during the day, there are plenty of restaurant and cafe options, both local and international. I 
I settled on Braga Pramai, where I had some pretty good nasi goreng, and then headed to Sumber Hindagan Bakery for pastry. Back to the train station for the next leg of the trip. I got on the train to Yogyakarta, but was getting off a few stations before Yogya. I had a ride meeting me there, and was a little worried about falling asleep and missing my stop. The following morning I woke up here. Hey, I'm in Bora Bora, which is a bit outside of Yogyakarta. I'm here to see the Borobodo Temple, which is a large Buddhist temple here. Uh, I got in in the middle of the night, it was dark, and so I woke up to see where I am, and that's always, a, that's always interesting, that's always a nice shock. I woke up, I had the hotel breakfast, I walked into town for a little bit, and now I'm about to go and actually see the temple. It's, it's nice, it's nice. I've heard this idea a few times that you know, the real Indonesia is not in Jakarta, it's not in the cities, but it's, it's out in the country and in the village. And I'm always wary of statements like that. And the city is just as real a place as any, maybe even realer. I don't know, what does real mean? But certainly when you get out of the city, when you get out of the grime and the grit and the hustle and the bustle and you get out into the country, and yeah, it's nice. Yeah, it's really nice out here. It's, uh, it's bucolic. I rode to Borobudur Temple on a bicycle bar from the hotel. You have to see the temple as part of a tour. You can buy tickets there, but I recommend booking a time online. I was in group 24 and I'll let him explain. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to Borobudur. My name is Lambang. The tour takes one and a half hours from now. The temple was constructed as a series of stacked platforms. With our guide, we ascend to the highest levels, stopping occasionally to have a look at one of the levels and for the guide to instruct us on how the temple was constructed and offer other little tidbits. He tells us about how some of the carvings were colored yellow by a Dutch photographer so that the figures would appear sharper in his photos. Eventually we reach the highest level, where 72 Buddhas await, each in their own perforated stupa.
time on the temple is limited, but after you exit the temple, you're free to look around the grounds for as long as you like. On my way back to the hotel, I passed a traditional Javanese house, repurposed into a coffee shop and boutique. The gentleman running the place pointed out some of the house's details, calling attention to the antique furniture, and then served me an excellent cup of coffee. His wife was weaving on a loom. The click clacking of the big machine made a relaxing backdrop in which to enjoy my coffee and ponder a return to the Javanese countryside. Booked a car from Boroboro to the city of Yogyakarta, Yogya for short. My hotel was around the corner from Maliabara Road. Yogyakarta is a major Javanese cultural center, and much of that culture is on display on and around Maliabara. The next morning, Maliaboro had shaken off its nighttime festivities and now presented itself ready for business. I'm ready as well. I have plans to see the Prambanan Temple. But first I grab some Indonesian spring rolls and an iced coffee. Iced coffee sweetened with palm sugar. The first stop is Yogyakarta Palace, residence of the Sultan of Yogyakarta. This place still operates as the official residence of the Sultan and also as a repository of local culture. It is also a museum. Next up is Tom and Sari, the Royal Gardens and Baths. The complex began construction under the first Sultan and saw its greatest use in the late 18th and early 19th century. Although you can't get into any of the water, the fountains and pools and cool stone rooms make a good counterpoint to the hot and humid Javanese climate. After the baths, I caught a car out to the Prambanan Temple compound.
You don't have to join a tour to see Promenade, but I hired one, and I recommend the same if you come here. After seeing the inside of the temple buildings, I walked to the back side of the complex and took some shots in the golden glow of the setting sun. My last night in yoga, I did some more wandering around. I found myself at the Alum Alun Selatan, a grassy square ringed by food stalls. Families peddled brightly illuminated cars around the square and sat in the grass eating and socializing. Indonesians, it seemed, loved being out together, eating, talking, making merry. <laughs> 